Hi everyone, Devorah Esther here. So I have a subject that I really, really, really love and it is all things science, all things medicine. And there's this one particular sefer that I got maybe about 10 years ago. I loved it then. I'm teaching it again now to a live class and I thought how great to put this up um, to a larger audience. And that is the mysteries of the creation and you ever go through the Torah and you see these like almost what seems to be like impossible scientific phenomena and you're wondering how could that be so? It's funny because Mysteries of the Creation goes into just that. It tells you about how certain things were possible like the sun not setting for an exorbitant amount of time in a battlefield and it's quite interesting because we think we're so advanced, but when you hear some of the stuff that I'm about to tell you, you're going to think we are so archaic. It truly is a wonder how much wisdom is in the Torah and how much wisdom our sages really had. And this is the reason why I love learning directly from them because there was so much wisdom and it wasn't polluted by all of this mishigas that you see going on today. So I want to start with the introduction because there are some really, really fascinating things to start off. And this book, I hope you really, really enjoy it as much as I do. It really is a gem. And with that, we'll start this class. So we'll be starting out in the introduction and it states, the Torah is all encompassing. The Midrash in Shira Shirin Rabbah 1.4 tells us, the Torah should have begun not at the creation, but at the first mitzvah given to Israel through Moshe. However, because Israel declared at Mount Sinai, whatever God spoke, we will listen and do, God revealed to them the process of creation. We are taught in the Mishnah in Avos 5.22 as well. Search deeply into the Torah, for it contains everything. Declare Moshe, Chan Devarim 4.6 on the subject, the Torah is your science and your philosophy in the eyes of the people. Who will hear all these laws and say this great nation is but a learned and sophisticated people? And the Ghazari says in 264.66 reveals too that the Sanhedrin, the high court of Israel, was required to know all the sciences and all the branches of knowledge of all all of which are necessary for understanding and application of the Torah. All the sciences begin with Israel and were taken from them by the Chaldeans, from them by the Persians, from them by the Greeks, and from them by the Romans. After long intervals and the numerous intervening steps, their Hebrew origin was forgotten. And of course, Again, if you've noticed some of these classes, I've always been saying, how did we get to this point? And I think a lot of people are starting to ask that, especially now with their, with their own lineage and their own genealogy. How did we get to this point? You have to go a step further and you have to start looking into what it is that you believe. Get to the origin of that. And so you see here that there is also, there's a genesis and then there's this whole evolution of how what we think we know came to be. And the truth is that, you know, you see this kind of debate going on. It's almost a silent war, you know, that's, that's being played out by the scientific community and the, the religious community. And oftentimes, um, you know, if we're really honest with ourselves, we know science is a great thing. There are many great, you know, things that have been discovered. But science is, it's not an exact science, put it that way. And I love to study like quantum physics. And the one thing that you will always, you know, pick up on is the fact that nothing ever seems final. You know, we're always evolving what we think we know. And so I always find like, uh, sometimes I think we have a problem just saying we don't know. And we think that we know based on what we understand at this moment. And that is subject to change. And so a lot of times we just say, you know, we found this, it's the absolute and that's it. And we just, I don't know if it's an arrogance thing, but we just don't know how to say, I'm still learning. So uh, let's go on. And it said, uh, Shmuel and Brachos 58b, I know the path of the stars as thoroughly as the path of the Nehordoro, my hometown. Shmuel was not only an astronomer and a hacham, records 
um, I'm sorry, records the Gemara, Bava Matsya 85b. Shmuel Yarkino O was Rabbi, uh, and this is uh, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi's personal physician as well as his disciple. Once Rabbi had a painful eye infection and Shmuel proposed to put medicine in the eyes and the Rabbi protested that he couldn't bear it. Shmuel offered to apply it on the surface of the eye as a bomb. The rabbi still feared the pain, so Shmuel therefore injected it through a cylinder into his neck, and the rabbi was cure. Who else gave hypodermic injections 1,800 years ago? So, I mean, again, this is like, this is what I'm saying. Like, we think we were so smart. Um, you just, you just hold on. You have no idea. And I think by the end, by the time we get to the end of this book, we're going to be like, where is all this knowledge hidden? <laughs> so it says, Rabban Gamliel and uh, uh, Rabbi Yehoshua traveled together by sea, and Rabban Gamliel took along bread to last the expected duration of the trip. Rabbi Yehoshua took an equal supply of bread plus additional flour. Rabban Gamliel's food ran out, and Rabbi Yehoshua shared his flour with him. Rabban Gamaliel asked his benefactor, how did you anticipate that the trip would take an extraordinarily long amount of time? And answered Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Yehoshua, there is a star that rises once every 70 years. The sailors aren't aware of that and their navigation is thrown off by it. I knew that it would appear on our trip and took along these extra provisions. Rabban Gamaliel expressed astonishment at the scientific knowledge of Rabbi Yehoshua and conversely, his poverty. Rabbi Yeshua responded, Don't wonder about me. You yourself have two disciples back home who know how to calculate the number of drops of water in the sea, yet have no food to eat. Rabban Gamliel himself was no slouch in science. The Gemara in Erevun 43b chronicles, Rabban Gamliel had a cylinder through which he could peer and see 2,000 amos, about two-thirds of a mile, on land or at sea. If one wanted to measure the depth of a ravine, he could look through the cylinder and determine the depth. If one wished to measure the height of a tree, he could measure his own height and shadow and the shadow of the tree and calculate the height of the tree. Perhaps we thought that telescopes and optical surveying instruments were developed in the last 300 years. And the Gemara Sanhedrin 106b and Hagiga 15b tell us, Doeg, the president of the Sanhedrin, when Shaul was king, could recite 300 legal decisions on the subject of a migdal that flies through the air. Now, you're probably wondering, what is a migdal? And I remember when I taught this to the live class, we took like a guess of what is a migdal. And I think a lot of people thought it was a bird. But you're about to get your tichels blown off and your kippahs if you're a guy listening. So... Rashi struggled to explain a migdal that flies through the air. The great commentator who explains virtually the entire scripture in Talmud, something that no other individual has done, could find no satisfactory explanation for it. In one place where this quotation appears, he offers four possible interpretations, and in another he proposes two others. Some of these require amending to the text of the Gemara. As Rashi notes, migdal in the language of the Talmud often means a vehicle. We today have no problem whatever, whatsoever understanding a vehicle that flies through the air, though Rashi 900 years ago never heard of one. Being aware of this, we do not intend to apologize for the Torah because of the opinions of scientists that differ from it, nor will we attempt to bend the Torah to accommodate their views. We will attempt only to derive from the Torah what the Torah has to teach us on the subject we will pursue the origin and the structures of the physical world. Therefore, let us not object that we are taking from science what we wish and rejecting what we choose. The charge is true. We accept whatever we find verified in the Torah, Shevi Kasav, and the Torah Sheba Al Peh. We reject any theory inconsistent with them. Let us offer a parable on the subject. An archaeologist discovered the ruins of Hithertro, an unknown ancient place. He found fragments of the foundation and parts of the wall. He discovered here and there parts of the contents of some of the rooms. Extrapolating from his finds, he, de he, de he developed a theory which explains who built the palace, when, for what purpose, and the layout and use of the various rooms. He published a learned volume on the discovery of the ruins and his interpretation of them. 
which made him famous. Somewhat later, another archaeologist digging further at the same site discovered large clays containing ancient parchments. On one of them, he found the design of the palace in all its rooms, gardens, and pathways. Inscribed below the drawings was a narrative description of the palace for whom it was built, when and for what purpose in the furniture and the usage of the various rooms. The drawings in the narrative were clearly written by the architect of the palace and the parchment was evidently the blueprint for its construction. This document did not comport at all with the elaborate theory developed by the discovery of the ruins. The first archaeologist insisted that, th that his theories were the true description of the ancient palace. The broken piece of pottery which prefaced must have been part of such and such utensil found in the ruins of room X proved did it not that room X serves such and such purpose, and therefore the traffic must have flowed just so, and therefore room Y has served this purpose, and therefore the palace must have been built in such and such date, therefore the king who had it built must have been so and so, and therefore. Ah, said the finder of the parchment, that's all fine speculation, but this document shows beyond a doubt the origin of the building, the purpose in each chamber, hallway, an item of furniture, what was done with it, and by whom. Your elaborate extrapolations from min minuscule amounts of ambiguous evidence cannot stand against the clear explication of the building written by the architect who designed it. There can of necessity be no conflict between nature and Torah, though there are always puzzles. But there can be, and of course there are, conflicts between the beliefs of scientists and Torah. But the theories of scientists are not necessarily science. Knowledge of the nature of the world, but merely an opinion on the subject necessarily derived from a relative smattering of evidence and formulated with all the biases held by the formulator. Of the Torah, on the other hand, Eliyahu and Tanadave Eliyahu Rabbah 31 informs us, God consulted the Torah when he created the world. This can be understood with an, with an analogy. A king who wishes to build a palace does not begin to build until he hires an architect to prepare design and blueprints for the palace and all its rooms. The contractor builds it by consulting the blueprints, in the same way God consulted the Torah and created the world. We may wonder, nevertheless, how do Chazal view experimental science, and the Gemara in Bechoros 8b is not silent on the issue. The Roman emperor asked Rabbi Yehoshua ben Hanina, who often represented the Jews before him, a question in biology. The emperor objected to Rabbi Yeshua's answer, saying the sages of Athens experimented and came to a different conclusion. Rabbi Yeshua answered, their experiment was faulty. But the Athenians are astute and knowledgeable scientists, he countered. You can't merely assume that they made an error, retorted Rabbi Yeshua. They may be knowledgeable, but we know more. How could Rabbi Yeshua be so, so sure of himself? He assumes methodological error on the part of the experimenters without being present, nor as far as we can tell from the Gemara, even reviewing their papers. Yet he is utterly sure of his information. Moreover, evidently not all the Chachamim eschewed empirical knowledge. The Midrash in Vayikra, Rabbah 19.1 reports, Rabbi Asiwa was an experimenter and he noticed the pair of crows building a nest, laying eggs, and their young hatching. He took the juveniles and put them in a new clay pot and sealed it. After three days, he opened the seal to see what became of the hatchlings, and he saw insects coming out of their excrement and the young crows eating them. He applied to what he found in the Pasuk in Eov 3841, who prepares food for the crow when his young cry to God, lost without sustenance. So you see, he put these little crows, uh, these little hatchlings, into this pot because he was depending on what the, the verse said in Eov, that, you know, who prepares the food, uh, you know, when they're lost without sustenance. And of course, Hashem prepares this food. And so sure enough, when three days later, I mean, technically they should have died. They hadn't eaten. They hadn't, you know, drank anything. And here the verse in Eo became true. So he knew um, that he could rely on what the Torah was saying about, you know, who prepares the food, which I really think is, if you really think about it, this is a lesson in Emunah for everybody. Like, don't worry about where your pranas is coming from. Just do what you got to do. Hashem is going to take care of this. So it says, we learned too in the Gemara on Chulun 57b. Rabbi Shimon ben Halafta had a reputation as an experimenter and used to use that method to prove his point in dispute with Rabbi Yehuda. 
He got that reputation from the following incident. Shlomo declared in Mishlei 6, 6 through 8, go to the ant, lazy one, see its ways and become wise. It has no captain, policeman, nor ruler, yet it prepares its food in the summer and gathers it, its yearly provisions at harvest time. Rabbi Shimon decided to test whether ants really have no ruler, and in the heat of the summer he found an ant hill, and he spread his cloak over it, and an ant emerged and saw the shade where previously the sun had been burning. And Rabbi Shimon marked that the ant, uh, so he could recognize it again. The ant returned to the nest, and he told his fellows, and many came out to enjoy the shade. Meanwhile, Rabbi Shimon removed the cloak, and when the ants found nothing but the hot sun, they killed the news bearer, who evidently misled them. So Rabbi Shimon said, that proves they have no ruler. And they, if they had, they would have had to get authorization from him to kill the apparent liar. Objection. That doesn't necessarily prove the point. Perhaps the ruler was the one who emerged and gave his authorization. Or perhaps the ruler established a prior rule that whoever misleads others should be killed. Or perhaps while they would normally have a ruler, this event occurred during an interdunum. Of such a time, scripture in Shoftim 17.6 records, In those days Israel had no king, and everyone did what he felt was right. And Rabbi Shimon then depended on the truth of Shlomo's statement as he assures us that ants are rulerless. This Gemara is uh, perplexing. If we must depend on the truth revealed in the Pasuk, what is the point of the experiment? Rabbi Sh Shimon ben Halafta knew the Pasuk before he began. Moreover, how could he have doubted the veracity of the scripture? We can learn the answer from the following. And the Torah in, in Sarah, Vayikra 12, dictates a period of defilement of 40 days for a woman who gives birth to a son and one of 80 days after a birth of a daughter. And according to the Mishnah in Nida 30a, Rabbi Yishmuel maintains that these periods reflect the time the fetus takes to form sufficiently to be recognizable as one sex or the other. The other Chachamin hold that both sexes develop in 40 days. The Gemara tells us his disputes told Rabbi Yishmael of an experiment conducted under Cleopatra, Queen of Egypt. Two of her servants, whom she had sentenced to death, were used for the test. They were impregnated and after 40 days executed to cut open and examine. One found it to be clearly carrying a male and the other a female. Rabbi Yishmael responded to this challenge. He said, I brought proof of the Torah and you bring me evidence from fools. Why does Rabbi Yishmael call Alexandrian scientists fools? Rabbi Yishmael believed that the experiment lacked necessary controls. Perhaps the mother of the girl was pregnant 40 days prior. There was another experiment conducted under Cleopatra using similar methodology. The results of this one were used by Rabbi Yishmael against the Chachamin, who disagreed with him for the male was recognizable at 41 days, while the female did not reach the state of development until 81. The Chachamin responds as Rabbi Yishmoel, don't bring us evidence from idiots. Why do the Chachamin call the scientists idiots? The Chachamin too had methodological quibbles with the structure of the test. The conception of the female may have post-dated the males by 40 days. This Gemara is puzzling. If the debate between Rabbi Yishmoel and the Chachamin is a scientific one, over the proper controls necessary for a test of this issue, why does each of them make it a contest between the Torah and science? If they reject empirical evidence, why do they each use it when it conforms to their respective opinions? Moreover, what evidence did both Rabbi Yishmael and the Chachamin have that the respective tests lack the controls they deem necessary? They cite none. Like Rabbi Yeshua, they seem to arrive at their conclusion first and from that assume that any contrary experimental evidence is defective. The Gemara is teaching us the only sure way of arriving to truth, even in matters of natural science, evidence from the Torah. Deduction from the Torah is direct and sure because the Torah is the blueprint of creation. It is a definitive source of knowledge of the world. The most important function other methods of knowledge can perform is to help us understand the Torah, which was what Rabbi Asai and Rabbi Shimon ben Halafdeh were engaged in. Where scientific method helps us elucidate the Torah, the conclusions derived from the experimental results are proven correct. Where to our knowledge they are neither supported nor contradicted by the Torah, they may be accepted tentatively. And that's tentatively. For we see daily through, throughout accepted science conclusions being modified entirely overthrown. 
Where the theories are contradicted by the Torah, they cannot be but defective. We may so conclude with no fear or error and with no evidence. So we see this all the time. You ever go on to, you know, you, you see the news and they say this year, you know, an, an all olive oil diet is so good for you. And then five years later, they'll come out and they say, you know, new studies show. And you hear this all the time where, you know, at one hand we see a study and what you have to keep in mind is that these studies, you know, what, what were the controls, right? What were the parameters under which they were conducting this study? And so sometimes the studies are flawed because they don't take into consideration all the factors, all the external factors that could possibly play out in a situation. And so, you know, oftentimes people, for whatever reason, I think more and more, um, you know, people will just rush to publish things and, you know, I, I mean, again, they'll publish things and then five years later we'll find a new study that totally debunks what they spent all that time trying to prove. So it states, scientific method, method is inherently and eminently fallible. It is subject to all the errors to which human reasoning, which interprets the concrete evidence, is liable. It is delimited by lack of knowledge, prejudice, arrogance, scientific poli politics, and chicanery. Said Stephen Gold, probably the most prominent exponent of Darwinism today, I suspect that the unconscious or dimly perceived finagling, doctoring, and, mas and massaging are rampant, endemic, and an unavoidable in a profession that awards status and power for clean and unambiguous discovery. By the way, I don't know if, the, if anybody else heard, I brought this up in the class too, but I could have sworn from the time of this recording, it must have been like maybe, maybe three or four weeks ago, I heard something on the news that said something about that Darwin may not have been so right on evolution after all. And so here we go. Like, um, you know, sometimes things take five years, sometimes things take a little bit longer than that. So it says, let us, re let us review a specific incident of known finagling. Now, this is a true story they're about to get into, and it says, in the atmosphere of unquestioning acceptance of Darwin's theory, the pendulum swung to another extreme of faith. Speculation ran rampant and nowhere more so than in man's origins. From Huxley's Man, Place in Nature in 1863, through Darwin's own The Descent of Man in 1871, right up to the stubborn quarrels of modern anthropology chronicled in John Reeder's Missing Links in 1981. The search for man's past has been littered with vain hopes and invented homilies. The Java man, the Peckin man, the Piltdown man, the Nutcracker man, all hanged abandoned on the branch of someone's imaginary ancestral tree. It is a cautionary tale for those who believe that in science facts always precede theories, or even that scientists are always dedicated followers of facts. And I think that's the other thing. You know, if you followed my Kosher 2.0, I think I hammered this point more than anything, right? If I were selling you a house, um, any kind of like good, you know, goods or services, you really would investigate, you know, the validity of what I'm saying, you know, how credible am I? But I think that a lot of people, once they see, you know, PhD, MD, you know, MSW, whatever it is, ESPN, you name, you name it. If they see all these little acronyms behind a name, somehow they have equated that with, they must know everything. And let's be objective here. You know, that's not to say that doctors aren't smart. There aren't new scientists aren't smart, but what they are learning is a curriculum that is taught to them. And technically you and I, any, any one of us can learn this curriculum. Like all it takes is that you sit there and you grasp what they're saying. So, but if I'm only giving you a limited curriculum, how can you know anything else? Right? So a lot of times this is what happens in science. But again, we just take their word for it because after all, they're scientists. They know more than me, right? Um, and, and this day and age, I think that, you know, we know that's not true. We know that's not true. We know that's not true. I think that, um, you know, just one last point on that. I think that sometimes we take um, confidence as a sign that someone is competent. And, you know, someone can talk a really good game, but they may not 
be all that they're cracked up to be. So it says, the vogue of reconstructing life-size models of our ancestors on the basis of their flimsiest fossil evidence or even no evidence at all started early. One of the best known scientists in Germany at the time when Darwinism swept through the academic world was Professor Ernst Haeckel. Haeckel was undoubtedly an interesting and at times even inspired biologist. His major contribution to evolutionary biology was his theory on recapitulation. This great biogenetic law, as he called it, seemed to him to prove evolution beyond a doubt. Watching an embryo develop, he said, you could see it passing through various ancestral forms of life. Thus, a human embryo stated as a single cell became worm-like, next showed fish characteristics, and, and this is gills that he was referring to, then amphibian ones, then mammalian ones, and th now he's thinking about a tail, and finally became a human being. The trouble is, Hakiel was a rogue. Time and again, Hakiel doctored his illustrations outrageously to support biogenetic law. For instance, he wrote when he saw that at a certain stage, the embryos of man and ape, the dog and the rabbit, the pig and the sheep, though recognizable as vertebrates, cannot be distinguished from each other. The fact can only be elucidated by assuming one common parentage. Can you imagine? So what he's saying is that like at a certain point in, in the beginnings of our life, you know, we could be a dog, we could be anything. Like this is what this is what the science is trying to say. So it says, I have, an illustra I have illustrated this significant fact by a juxtaposition of corresponding stages in the development of different vertebrates in my natural history of creation and in my anthropogeny, which indeed he had. But as a matter of biological fact, the embryos of men, apes, dogs, and rabbits are not all the same and can be easily distinguished by any competent embryologist. They only look the same in Hakiel's books because he chopped off bits here and there and added bits elsewhere to make them seem identical. Another example was his illustration of the worm-like stage through which all vertebrates were supposed to have passed. He published three identical drawings captioned respectively a dog, a chicken, and a tortoise. In 1886, a Swiss professor of zoology and comparative anatomy complained that Hakiel had s simply used the same woodcut of a dog embryo three times. Over the years, various of other forgeries were exposed. To illustrate the embryo of Gibbon at the fish stage, Hakiel used an embryo of a different kind of monkey altogether, and then sliced off those parts of the anatomy inconvenient to his theory, such as arms, legs, heart, navel, and other non-fishy appendages. Another time, he altered the shape of the embryo embryological drawings to make the brain cases of fish, frogs, tortoises, and chickens look the same. Again, he would insert imagery, animals, in neatly graduated progression of forms. On the page, this looked as if it demonstrated life developing to simple to complex. But readers were given no hint that some of the animals were real and some were pure fiction. An isolated but particular brazen example of forgery was when he extended the 33 vertebrae of a human to 35 and then for good measure tacked on a tail with a further nine. Writes Wendell Bird, Isley and Romer mentioned casual discarding of anomalous fossils. Wendell Reich described how paleontological facts are disregarded and replaced with purely speculative constructions on the evolution of man. And Keith recounts arbitrary rejection of human remains mixed with the alleged pre-human remains. Fraud in science is so widespread that one book categorizes different forms. Another book describes and documents scores of instances under the title Betrayers of the Truth, Fraud and Deceit in the Halls of Science, and a new book supplements the list with the title False Prophets. This situation is described by Quinn all over the country, institutions are busy putting in place formal and explicit policies for dealing with dishonesty in research. And clearly the impetus to do so comes from the numerous and well-publicized case of scientific fraud that have occurred in the recent years. The fact that institutions find it necessary to make formal policy on such matters is a good indication that the informal self-policing mechanisms of the scientific community are not doing their job. Are the conclusion deduced by Hachamin from the Torah, however, any more than one derived from nature, not midwifed by human reasoning? Granted that we need not worry about arrogance and chicanery, 
For the Hachamin who make the deductions are Tzadikim. And we are taught in the Gemara in Moyoed Katon 17a, the scriptures in Malachi 2.7 assert, the lips of the Chayan guard learning, and the Torah they shall seek from his lips. For he is an angel of God. If a master is like an angel of God, seek Torah from his lips. If he does not act like a divine angel, do not seek Torah from him. The Chachamin are still human, however, and therefore subject to error. How then can we depend without question on the words of the sages? In the Midrash and Shemos Rabbah 41.3 will lead us to the answer. And the Pasuk in Mishlei 2.6 declares, God gives knowledge from his mouth, intelligence and understanding. Knowledge is great, but intelligence and understanding are greater. Therefore, God gives knowledge, and to those whom he loves, he gives from his mouth intelligence and understanding. We can appreciate this with a parable. A rich man was sitting at his table eating. His young son walked in home from school, and the father took a piece of food from the table and offered it to the child. And the son said, I want, the, I want to have the one in your mouth. And the father took the food he had already bitten off and gave to the child. Why? Because of love. Just so God gives knowledge, and to whomever he loves... Most, he gives from his mouth intelligence and understanding. The Midrash teaches us an astounding lesson. The reasoning of the Hachamin is not human reasoning, but divine. It is not subject to the frailties of a human mind, for it is received from the mouth of God. Nor does the fact that the Hachamin often disagree with one, one another prove that the reasoning of at least one participant to each dispute failed. But we are getting into a subject we intend to consider in chapter 1 and subsequently. Rather, let us begin in the beginning. And so with that, that's going to conclude the introduction. So, you know, it's very, again, you know, very uh, interesting because this book was written a while ago. And of course, you know, some of the things that we quoted obviously were well before our time. But it's just so incredible that, you know, the more things change, the more things stay the same. And again, you know, we really have to caution where we're getting our sources of information from. It is incumbent upon all of us to really just to stop and think. Uh, you know, I think, especially in a, in a day and age like today, where so much information is available, so like, you know, everything is out there and there's information everywhere. Like, I mean, I think I could become a mechanic just by watching YouTube videos. Like, mamash, like, it's like, it's crazy how accessible information is. But this flip side of that, you know, where that is good, you know, the, the flip side of that is that it, there's anyone can do it, right? Anyone, you don't have to be knowledgeable. You can be a total quack and you can just go out there and spew whatever nonsense you want. And you probably will find followers. That's what's crazy. And then there are some people that just like, they don't care. They don't care if they know it's not true. They're just mamash, like they're just, they can't even put the spoon to their mouth. Just tell me how to live. Tell me what to do. I don't want to think about it. Um, so there's a lot of like, you know, we we have to be responsible uh, for for guarding what it is and who it is that we're learning from. Um, but, you know, I, I really have to tell you, it's just it's very fascinating to me. It really, really is fascinating to me. And of course, I wish I could be a fly on the wall in every scientific experiment because they are truly they're remarkable. They really are remarkable. Um, but you know, we are a world of why we're an endless world of why I think it's probably one of the first words we learn. Um, but thankfully, you know, truly like the book says, you know, when you have somebody who, you know, who is learned, uh, who is close to Hashem and Hashem clearly is close to them, sit by them, learn from them. Um, it just, it, it, you know, it's so great just to have a pure source. Like, you know, you just know, you know, the sages are really they are like your grandfathers that would never steer you wrong. Um, they're so knowledgeable. They're so wise. They've been around the block. And it's, it's just incredible that they wrote so many things, you know, some of them thousands of years ago, and they're still applicable to today. So that just gives you uh, just an inkling about how much understanding Hashem really put into them. So that's it for today. And I hope we'll all be together again soon. Bisrat Hashem. You can follow this series, Mysteries of the Creation with Devorah Esther, on YouTube at Gimel Dalit 777. Click subscribe to be notified of upcoming share. If you've enjoyed this video or know someone who would, please share it. Siku Mitzvot.